today we're looking at interior design fee structures and just having a look at the pros and cons of each so that you can, if you're looking at how you want to price your interior design services, you can just have a look at what might be the right system to use for you. So we'll go into all of the industry standard uh, ways of pricing that interior designers around the world price, but also some of the not so industry standard that people are using, which they probably shouldn't be using. Um, and from my experience, I'll give you all the pros and cons uh, as to why you would want to use these um, for different types of services. So let's get into it. Percentage based pricing. So this is where you price your design services based on a percentage of the total construction cost. And this is a way that interior designers and architects have been pricing their projects for many years, actually. And it's a really tried and tested way of, um, of pricing a project. It ends up being quite accurate, actually. The thing is, um, and that's probably one of the biggest benefits, that it is a pretty accurate way of pricing. The problem with this, however, is that clients typically see a conflict of interest. And this is potentially why they don't uh, why less and less people are, um, are pricing this way, because uh, the client will think, well, it's in your interest to have a higher construction fee, a, a constru construction cost, because you have a higher construction fee as a result. But that isn't the way that we work as designers, but a client typically may not trust that. So that is the biggest downside, but the, you know, the the upside is that it is actually a, a you know a really tried and tested way of pricing for many many years now, um, and it's a relatively accurate way of pricing a project. Hourly rate pricing. So this is basically where you get paid for your time. So you get you charge out an hour and you get paid for an hour. Obviously, this way you would be keeping a regular timesheet so that you can back up what you're charging with um, accurate facts for your client. So you know, that is one of the pros of working uh, per hourly because when you don't know how long something is going to take, then you can estimate that, give it a cap and then say, well, this is how long I think it's going to take. Let's kind of try and bill for these um, hours or um, like you're still being paid hourly. But it is, you know, I mean, one way of doing it is is uh, capping it at a certain amount and then asking for more time if if you go over the time. So, once again, in, in, in terms of a, a way of working that is a disadvantage of this way, not knowing how many hours you are going to be working on a project doesn't allow you to manage your time very well. It also kind of gives you this exponential possibility of this, this project going over time. Um, also, sometimes, well, if, you're, if you haven't got the right mindset, you would typically over deliver and undercharge because you think, oh, well, I shouldn't have been charging for the time that I was thinking about the project, which you totally should. But, um, well, especially if you've clocked those hours down to that project. So, uh, you know, there are a lot more disadvantages, I feel, to this way of pricing, but people do price this way quite a lot, which, um, you know, isn't, it's not a bad way to price, but uh, I mean, I even knowing your hourly rate is really important, but on a larger project or on a project where you have now got some experience, this would be not a very good way to, to charge because you're not going to be able to take on multiple projects at this time because you wouldn't be able to um, uh, work on, like organize your time very efficiently. Um, and then of course, for the client, they're terrified that this project could just blow out a budget because they can't um, control your time either. So um, it's not a very reliable way to use in terms of pricing a whole project, but it can be good for pricing little parts of projects where you really just, you know, the main parts, but um, if something goes over or if you want to sort out little bits and pieces, then you, uh, you charge per hour. Pricing per meter squared. So obviously this is where you give a price and you multiply that by the square footage or the square um, meter squared of the property. This works really well if you're an experienced designer um, and you work on specific types of projects that aren't complicated. So for example, commercial projects where you're just doing a fit out or if you're working on just decorating types of projects. This doesn't work 
when you're working on really complex projects, typically like the kinds of projects that I work on, where there's a lot of detail work, um, the concept evolves throughout the project, you, you couldn't work like this because um, you just cannot give a flat rate, basically, just based on a, a squared figure for, for a property. This also doesn't work on properties that are small. So, for example, in the UK, unless you're working on really, really large properties, this wouldn't be working to your advantage. The only other way where uh, the only other uh, pl uh, way that to price this that works to your advantage is if you are uh, including the build cost. So, because as uh, builders, we can price uh, per meter squared because we've got that information there. So if you're an experienced designer, this might work for you. But if you're an inexperienced designer, this could be really dangerous, especially if you don't know the types or if you're not very specific about the types of projects you're working on and they go into detailed design. So if it's a light project, it's you know really straightforward, there's no detailing involved, uh, per meter squared would be an easy way to price. But uh, if it's a more complex type of project, you do want to be pricing this way. Lump sum pricing. So this is also known as fixed fee or I call it package rate. And this is typically where you provide a fixed fee for the amount of work that you're going to be doing. And a lot of people have been burnt with this, but I think the reason why they've been burnt is because they didn't put boundaries in place for how what they were pricing for. So the reason why I think this is a really great way to price small projects or concept style projects is because you don't have to sit there writing out or thinking about what all of the things that you need to price. You know what is involved and how much it costs. So, and there is no deviation from that or you add a, a, a rate onto that. So if there is any variation. So if you have a very specific thing that you're pricing, package pricing actually works really well. It doesn't work well for, you know, if you're at the beginning of a project and then you've just quoted, uh, so you need to know the difference between an estimate and a quote, you, if you quote a package fee for the whole project phase, including concept, detail design, implementation, construction, sourcing, then final install and styling, at the beginning of the project, which could be two years earlier, I mean, it's insane, you would never do that. So knowing how to use package pricing would be um, obviously the most beneficial but knowing that you can use it really effectively for uh, for small projects or small stages of a project that would actually work really well because um, you're saving a lot of time clients also like this pricing system because it gives a, them a really clear way of budgeting so they, especially for smaller or low cost projects, and this is why I think the container for a small project is actually a really great way to price these because the client typically on these smaller projects has a, a very small budget. And so they're very conscious of that budget. And so your design fee isn't conflicting with their budget and they see that as a really good deal. So for those smaller projects, this can be, if done properly, a really great way to price. Day rates. So day rates are where we basically do a short burst of work that we've agreed in a certain amount of days. And this can be really, really great for projects that are like styling projects where you're on site and you really have to complete something in a fast amount of time. But the cons are, and I find that there are more cons with day rates, is that um, it's hard because the client is paying for a specific amount of days, they're watching you. And if you complete it faster, it means that they they kind of feel like you've taken advantage of them. So there's not a real easy way to make a profit. As a designer, obviously, we should be accounting for profit into our days, um, into, our, into our prices. And I think pricing as a day rate can be really hard for that to come to fruition because um, the client is watching typically uh, where their money's going. And if you've priced for four days and you only do two, they're going to wonder, well, did she overprice this and will I use her again? So just think about how the perception looks from the client side. And unfortunately, that affects whether you're going to get the job or not. Cost plus markup. 
So this is where you, if, typically when you're sourcing furniture, you're purchasing the furniture and then you're adding a percentage or a cost on top of uh, what it is that you're purchasing. So this works well if you are buying a lot of furniture, but if you're not and you're not charging a design fee, uh, then you're basically trying to sell furniture and you're not getting paid for the work that you're doing. And so you can see how this can be really poorly balanced, especially these days when people can check your prices online very quickly and then compare against what it is that you're getting paid. So why not just get paid a design fee at the outset? So cost plus markup can work. Um, obviously, you would need to know in some places of the world whether you're acting as the um, principal or as agent. So whether you have to disclose your fees or whether you don't. And there's a lot of complications in terms of how you run this ethically so um, and a lot of rules behind it but when you're at the uh, ff &E or sourcing stage so you wouldn't want to be doing like a concept for free and then only making money once you start or if the client decides to purchase the furniture from you so um, i think in one way you can um, make this work for you but not at all different phases of the project, if that makes sense. Even though I know in the US, um, a lot of designers do charge this way, which I think it is nuts. I think it's worth considering only charging that phase of a project in this way, if it works for you. Value-based pricing. So this has become really popular with recent coaches. And I think this is uh, important to discuss because this is where you basically choose a figure and you do the work for that figure. Typically, you work out how much it is going to um, cost you by using another method. And then you would add on what you feel the value of the project is going to add so that you can typically charge a higher rate. The problem with this is that most people don't use another way of pricing and they just come up with a figure out of thin air that they feel is a really good price. So typically if they had been paid, you know, let's just say 3000 for a project, they'll just double it or triple it and go 9k, it's a really good price. The big problem with this is if you haven't actually worked out how long this project is going to take you anyway, you will always over deliver and you will always, because you think it's a good rate, uh, you'll end up <laughs> undercharging because you will never have gotten the project price right unless you had previous experience. So just picking a figure out of thin air, and I know that's simplifying it, is never the right way. You always have to work out how long a project is going to take you and then obviously add the profit on top. So if you were going to add, uh, if you were going to charge this way, don't get tricked into just thinking about what the value of the project is. It's you still work out that the minimum it's going to cost you to, to do the project. And then you would add the value on top to inflate the price so that you'd get a bigger profit. Time boxing. Time boxing is where you get paid a specific amount to do a specific set of tasks um, in a specific amount of time, typically. So this can be really great because it means that you can use your skills to do really you know, complex things in, and, and get paid for that. In a way, it's kind of like a flat fee. What I don't like about this, and I suppose this is a big um, uh, like disadvantage of um, working this way, is that you're breaking down the tasks, which mean that the client can pick and choose what tasks they're going to get you to do. And that doesn't work as a designer. It, it almost feels like they're an employer that is going to kind of only picking the things that they want. And that doesn't work for us typically as designers because we don't do our best work and we don't get to charge for the things that we typically enjoy because they're just, you know, in most cases, they just want the technical side because that's the part they can't do themselves. And so you're constantly, I mean, if you love being a technical designer, then that's great. Then that's a really easy way to, to get repeat work. But um, it, for the majority of us designers, this is a, a not a, a really smart way to, to price because um, we get taken advantage of really. Working on retainer. So this is where you get paid a set fee 
uh, regularly, either each week or each month, to do a certain amount of hours or a certain type of job every, uh, every week or every month. I used to do this at the beginning of my career when I first started my business for other architects, for developers and for other interior designers. And this helped me get regular income when I still wasn't sure how to get clients or how to win projects. And so this was a really great way to start. So the pro is that you can get a, a regular income uh, and for a set amount of time. So it's not like being employed, but um, it's more like contracting, what we call over here, um, contracting for a specific amount of hours for, um, uh, for an agreed amount of time, which can help you feel just a little bit more relaxed about um, having your um, having an income coming in when you're working on your own projects. So one of the pros obviously is getting a regular income uh, but the con is that you are kind of being employed and then you have set times that you do have to give away to other people and you're not free to negotiate your time um, well, you can if, you, if, if that works. I found with my developers that it wasn't as easy. They were very specific about what they wanted and when they wanted it each week. So, um, and, you know, they're paying you almost like a salary. So they have to, uh, you have to make sure that you deliver on time. Phase pricing. So this is where you price each phase separately. And this is how I price my projects. And it's a fantastic way to price projects because especially if you're working on longer term projects like I do, uh, that can take up to five years. And, you know, these projects, you can't estimate uh, what the project cost is going to be, uh, especially without a concept. So obviously you do concept phase first, you'd price that, get paid. Um, and then you'd start, obviously you'd get paid before you price, uh, before you start the project. And then um, next phase, you'd estimate the next phase and you get paid for that. And then you keep going through the phases. So that is a great way to price because you get paid. <laughs> um, obviously you would work out the pricing same way you would work out all of them, which we're going to go through in another video. Um, but this is a really great way to, uh, to price because it's clear, it helps convert the client because they see the breakdown of what they're getting um, and obviously it helps when you're charging higher prices. The cons to this however are that um, it doesn't work for all projects especially not small projects because this pricing way can be a little bit too complicated for small projects. That's why another system would make a bit more sense. Combination pricing. So this is obviously where you price multiple ways depending on um, the project. The pros to this is that you obviously have a very flexible pricing system and I actually used to give my clients this option in every fee that I offered uh, for my larger projects, not smaller ones obviously. Um, and I always got a sale. So because it gave them an alternative way of pricing, the figures were the same, but they just saw it differently. Um, it allowed them to um, make a decision based on the information I was giving them. The biggest downside to this is that clients might get confused as to why you're pricing differently. And um, a confused buyer, a, conf a confused person doesn't buy. And because of that, um, it might, you, if you haven't delivered this correctly to um, your client. So if you're not experienced enough really um, in pricing projects or um, writing, uh, selling your services, this might come across as a little bit confusing to them. Bidding. So in some parts of the world, we call this bidding or tendering. And what this is, is where you provide uh, a quote, but also typically because it's a competition with other interior designers, you would be required to do a little bit of free work. And that often includes a concept of some kind. And I think obviously that is the downside where, um, I mean, I've seen officers spend weeks for free designing to win bids. And um, I mean, this is done often in the design industry, in architecture offices, in architecture offices as well as interior design offices. So it's, it's pretty common. Um, but of course, uh, it's a risk and there's a lot of uh, effort that goes into winning this project. So if you don't win, uh, you've just, uh, you know, 
put a lot of time and effort for free. However, if you do win, these are typically iconic projects, they're big projects, they might be worth that risk. And so bidding is something that's been done in the industry probably since the beginning, as far as I know, especially for commercial projects or really large projects. Um, so it's definitely, if you've got the capacity to do this and you're one of those designers who wants an iconic project or something to be involved in where it's going to lift your um, reputation or, or name, it's it's definitely c worth considering once you get to a point where uh, you can, um, you I mean, you're not like living day to day. So you have the extra profit to absorb those fees. Pricing per route. So this is one of my pet hates, but only because most people underprice it. And it's typically designers who are starting out who underprice uh, and because they see other people pricing per room and they think it's a good idea. So the benefits to pricing per room is that it's simple. It looks really simple. It's this is how much this room is going to cost you. And the client thinks that's great. However, ultimately what you're doing is charging a flat fee for concept, detail design, construction potentially, install, sourcing, styling. You've just priced the whole project into this small container which is which looks typically uh like a uh, like a, a decent figure but it never is and so if you have got some experience under your belt and you've designed the same room multiple times so you only specialize in bedrooms and you design bedrooms with a particular style so you only do rustic bedrooms and so you know that it's going to take you X amount of hours and this is your overheads and whatever on your project. And I can do this with a, with a profit for, you know, $3,000 or pounds. Then you could potentially safely uh, do that with a good terms and conditions set. But I think it's pretty dangerous. And the problem is, is that most interior designers who do price this way are startups. So I would avoid it at all costs personally because it is basically a flat rate for a whole project which is pretty silly sliding scale pricing so this isn't technically an industry standard way of pricing but a lot of people price this way so what it is is you do your research on the client and then you charge the client what you think that they are going to pay so <laughs> Obviously, you can already see how this is going to um, not be a good idea because, I mean, you still need to always like, and this goes to for all of the ways that you price, you still need to always work out a bare minimum of what it is that you pay, uh, what you need to work out for yourself. But the problem is that when you price with a sliding scale, if the client says, oh, I really only just want this or oh, we really can't afford to, we've just bought the house, we've maxed out our mortgage, you're going to really feel for this person and think, oh, well, okay, they just want, you know, a full set of designs plus, you know, all the sourcing and plus this and plus that. I'll, I'll give it to them just to get the job. You always underprice. <laughs> and then, and I promise you because this happened to me, you'll get really upset when the client buys a bed frame that's 10 times worth more than your design fee. And it happens because they made you believe that they couldn't afford a lot. So, you know, sliding scale pricing, I mean, it's worth having a look <laughs> at what you think, but I mean, this isn't, this isn't a way to price a project. This is, you know, you don't want to be confused with a client seeing the value in what it is that you're presenting and affording your services. So being able to afford your services or seeing the value in your services are two very different things. And sliding scale pricing is you or them seeing the value in your services um, or not seeing the value in your services. So you need to up that part of what it is that you deliver in order um, and find a different way to, to price because <laughs> I've added this in just because this is a way that people price, but I would stay well clear away from, uh, from pricing this way. So hopefully this has given you at least uh, a kind of a master view of all the different ways that you can price. In the next video, we're going to detail 
or look into more detail into how to start pricing because this is just an overview of the different ways that you can price. So in the next video, we'll look at how to start pricing a project. And then in the video after that, we'll look at the kind of biggest misconceptions about pricing projects and some of the biggest problems that you'll come up against um, when, you, uh, when you start the process. Obviously, I run a mentorship program for interior designers who want to start a business. Uh, you can check that out at iws.online.